Hello, my name is Timothy Naftali, um, and this is Afterwards. Um, I'm director of the Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum in Yorba Linda, California, and it is my honor and privilege today to have as uh, my guest on Afterwards, Sir David Frost, to discuss his book, Frost Nixon. Sir David, thank you for joining us oh, today. A pleasure to be here, Tim, a pleasure. Um, we, we have the opportunity, today we are going to be discussing Sir David's book, which is a which is both a, the story of his famous and significant interview with Richard Nixon in 1977, unprecedented interview with, Sir, uh, with the former president, but also his reflection since then. Because this book, which has just come out, discusses not only the interview, it, uh, it contains, in fact, transcripts of the entire, uh, the, all four of the uh, programs, but it's also an opportunity for Sir David to look back at this interview and put it into its historical and political context. Well done, Sir David. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Tim. It's been a very pleasurable experience to revisit these, uh, these major issues with the, in the background of this play and the film and all those things going on, but to go back to the actual root material. Um, I want to give, I think it's, it, it, it would be nice for our audience to get a, a better sense of, of you. Um, right now, Sir, Sir David, uh, of course, is the host of uh, uh, Frost Over the World, which is on Al Jazeera English. Um, but, Sir David, you've had a long and illustrious career. And I would actually like to ask you about um, some of the things you did before you interviewed uh, Richard Nixon. Tell us about That Was the Week That Was. Well, that was the week that was, was an incredible experience because first of all in Britain and then in America, I mean, it was the start of my career in America as well, but it started in England. And I was only, I was only 23 when I sort of co-created, uh, that was the week that was, with the producer Ned Sharon. And it was thrilling because particularly where it started in England, between 1956 and 62 when it started, ever since things like John Osborne's Angry Young Men in Look Back in Anger and the Suez War and things. <clears throat> the young in England had been really impatient. They'd been impatient for a demolition job. They'd been impatient for an irreverence uh, that didn't exist and that people were still talking about as they were the elders and, and betters of the young and all of that. So that there was a real appetite for that sort of show. And when it, and in fact, if I hadn't done it, I would have wanted to watch it because it was something we all wanted to see. And so that was really the starting point. And the, the show started at 10.30 at night, um, at, which is, was later than it is now in any way uh, later in America, in Britain than in America and so on. But anyway, 10.30. And it was expected to have an audience at best of two and a half million. And it got the two and a half million the first week. And the second week it got four, and then six, then eight, then nine, then eleven. It, within six weeks it had gone to a breathtaking audience at 10.30 a night of 12 million. And in fact, by that stage, I, I felt that uh, I could afford, just about, to visit Harrods for the first time, the great store. And I was in Harrods and I was writing out a cheque. And as I was doing so, the guy behind the counter was saying, and. Oh, Mr. Frost, we I just want you to know we never miss your show. And I said, thank you very much, Karen. <laughs> and, he, and, and, and he said, and if we go out for the evening, then we make sure that we get back home by 10.25. So we're there in front of the set at 10.30. I said, thank you very much, and carried on writing. And he said, and if we're at home, what we do is we make sure that we've done all the washing up and lay the table for breakfast by 10.25 so that we're there ready, ready for the show. And I said, oh, thank you very much handed him the check, and he said, do you have any means of identification? <laughs> well, well, wait, you've got... A, a moment of realism. A moment of realism, but, but I think <clears throat> the audience needs to know why it was so unusual, the success of this program was unusual. This was not a serious news program. No, it was, it was successful because it was irreverent, I think, really. People were searching for irreverence. They had this staid establishment, this staid Conservative Party that had been there for too long, was tired and exhausted, and the public was tired and exhausted with them, and and so that it was a, it was an irreverent sort of demolition job, and that was the thing that people wanted, the young wanted, but to their astonishment, the older people found that they loved too. When you watch 
if you watch John Stewart or Stephen Colbert, mm. do you have a sense that you're watching really the children, the product of what you started in Britain so many well, years ago? Well, uh, very much part of the same lineage, yes. I mean, two of Saturday Night Live, too, originally. And indeed Laughing, which George thought was always very generous about uh, how much uh, Laughing owed to that was the week that was. And of course, in England, too, it led to a much greater freedom. I mean, there were things, you know, there were rules in the BBC about you couldn't do sketches about religion and you couldn't impersonate politicians and you couldn't mention religion and all those sort of things that we just blew out of the window. Uh, but, and it meant that people coming along after us had that much extra freedom. Uh, did, did uh, I, mean, I believe John Cleese and the Monty Python gang also went mm. to Cambridge. Yes, what, what happened was there was uh, that was the week that was, and then the next comedy show I did, which was more deliberately more social than political, more contemporary than than topical, was a show called The Frost Report, which brought John Cleese to television first time, first time he'd ever done television, um, and also two people who became huge in British and in other television, the two Ronnies, Ronnie Barker and Ronnie oh. Corbett, so that we had these three people exploding as stars all at the same time in the Frost Report. And we had amazing writers, I mean, including in our writing team were, or our performing team, were f all five of the uh, Pythons, apart from Terry Gilliam, uh, who, who had a different background, but I mean, there was John Cleese, Graham Chapman, Eric Idle, um, who were the other two in that group? Michael Palin and Terry Jones, of course, um, and uh, and so they were they were all part of the writers. So that that show, the Frostbolt, the writers became as famous as, as the performers, and the performers became very famous. It's astounding. And you were in your your mid twenties at this point. Yeah, yeah. And I was really lucky, triggering off these things, and another series called At Last, the 1948 show, and specials with with various of them. It was. It was a wonderful way to start. Wonderful. Now, how do you go from that to interviewing presidents, kings, and uh, prime ministers? Um, well, basically, it was due to America as much as anything, really, because I came to America to do that was the week that was, originally 64, 65. And then when I was coming to America to do specials and things like that, I saw more and more of the thing that an invention that really hadn't taken over in England, namely the talk show. And I was intrigued by this, the use of an audience and so on. I wanted it to be more than just showbiz. Uh, I wanted it to be uh, political and, and have an audience that could participate as well as, oddly enough, there was no participating audience show then. So the show, the sh show had a range of people across the, the last the last week of the first series had Sean Connery, lighter interview, but, but, but a scoop because he didn't do many scoops. Then on the Thursday night, the Foreign Secretary uh, of Great Britain saying that uh, he'd realized that he didn't have the abilities to become Prime Minister and, uh, and so he would never try to be Prime Minister, take over from Harold Wilson. and. Uh, and indeed, one of the papers had a cartoon of Harold Wilson following this thing where he said, I'm never going to try to be Prime Minister. He had a large, large list of the other five or six potential successors to him. And he was saying, he was showing me the list and saying, would you mind interviewing these five as well? You know, <laughs> hopefully that they were going to gain it. So, and that was, that was so that just to give an example of the, the variety of the week, so that Wednesday, Connery, Thursday, George Brown, Friday, Dr. Savundra, which was a mega expose of, a, of an insurance swindler and who'd escaped justice for six or eight months and so on, and that was a... And before that in the program, there was a, a great American, Dr. Robert Ettinger, the man who invented, I think, cryonics, which was this thing oh. of... You know, where, whereby you... Freezing gonna, people, no? Hmm? Pardon? Freezing people. Yeah, freezing people who, with incurable diseases and then thawing them out when there was a cure. Right. Now, and, and, and there was... There was this 
I suppose you'd call it a coffin in the studio, but I mean, it was sort of papier mache. <laughs> you know, it wouldn't withstand anything. It wouldn't withstand being taken down to the, the corner store, much less for 70 years. <laughs> I mean, it was absolutely. And John Cleese was working with me on that program because he's very interested in journalism as well. So he was sort of, as it were, an intellectual Ed McMahon on, on the program. And so he was, dem he was to demonstrate this coffin and so on. And, and so he was sliding into this, this thing. And the last one heard from him as he slid in was a sigh followed by him saying, I sometimes wonder why I ever bothered to get a law degree. <laughs> And then disappeared in this cardboard coffin, as it were. But, uh, but the uh, so that that show was very varied, and, the three, and that was the that was the bridge between um, satire and interviewing. So that's yeah. that's how you kept the irreverence. Yes, there's no doubt with with John Cleese as as your uh, yeah. sidekick. Exactly, exactly. And uh, and I just did an interview with him last week with dear John for we're doing a special in Britain. A two-hour special for the, to celebrate the 40th year of the Frost Report, in fact, the year when it won the Golden Rose of Montreux. So, we're, so I'm right back into all those sketches as well at the moment, well, I'm sure in addition to everything else. To everything else. Uh, well, I'm sure, I'm sure that it has, it's timeless. Um, so when do you, because by, by the mid-70s, uh, you have a reputation for hard-hitting interviewing. Um, and you basically put people on the hot seat successfully. Where does that, is it something you develop? Because again, we're talking about a bridge from, from satire. When, does, when do well, we start I, seeing yeah, that? I suppose it's a natural bridge in a way, isn't it? I suppose to bring the same approach that one had to satire to interviewing, not to all interviewing, because obviously if you're interviewing the Archbishop of Canterbury, he wasn't an insurance swindler like uh, <laughs> Dr. Emil Savundra, because that's one of the vital things, of course, that people don't do with interviews. They they uh, they often do adopt the same technique for everybody, and 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 that doesn't work because it's pointless, you know, hectoring someone when you haven't got anything to hector them with. You know, it just shuts them up rather than opens them up. You know, and that sort of thing. But uh, but so that from there on, it was. Uh, I mean, basically, it was logical that that one wanted to still do exposés when one was doing interviews as well. I suppose it's sort of an exposé and the, and the fascinating, this guy had, uh, I mean it doesn't sound so much money now, but he'd got away with £350,000, which I don't know, is probably six million dollars today, I don't know what, anyway, and got out of the company just before it fell. and. We had people, as he knew, in the studio who had not got the money they were owed from their insurance when they, when their husbands died in a car crash or whatever, and, and so on. So it was a very emotional, very emotional program, and uh, and he didn't help himself. It must be said by saying at one point, "I didn't come here to talk to these peasants." <laughs> peasants. I came to joust with England's premier swordsman. Well, now, forget about the swordsman, you know, dismissing victims as peasants. You know, I was so angry with that. I, I got more angry in that program than any program I've ever done, really, I think, because, because of the peasants thing and, and at the end him saying, I have no moral responsibility for these people, and I have no legal responsibility, but no moral responsibility. And I remember saying, you may have no legal responsibility. I hope you do. But how do you get rid of moral responsibility? How do, we'd all love to know that, and the audience were baying for his blood, really, at that point. And, and it was very dramatic, and a point I felt very strongly about. And at the end of the program, I felt so angry that you know how, I don't know, maybe they'll do it at the end of this uh, program, but you know the lights go down and the two people carry on talking, but you can't hear what they're saying. And when at the end of the program, that's what happened in this program, but at the end of the program I thought, I'm damned if I'm going to stay here 
and apparently talk to him in a civilized fashion as if I've forgotten my anger because I'm still angry. So I just walked off and left him there all on his own. Because you, that, as you said, it was unusual because usually an interviewer has to be outside, right? Mm. Yeah, and most of the time I think probably should be, but the uh, but there are certain occasions. I I think that there are too too many pointless confrontations when when people just adopt a hectoring tone, but don't have the the goods, don't have a smoking pistol, don't have whatever. And I think in those situations, um, you know, it's a waste of time to shut people up. Uh, in that particular way, but then there are situations where it has to be with Savundra. There had to come, there had to come a confrontation at some point. It came earlier in the program because he said this thing about the peasants and so on. Uh, but but there has to be sometimes in uh, interviewing General Amin, for instance, or someone like that. I mean, you're that you're going to have a confrontation. Were you in Kampal? Did you? Did you interview General Amin? Yes, it's one of the very few interviews he, he ever did. And uh, it's one of the occasions when he, it was an occasion when he very kindly offered to, to the Queen that he would fly over and solve the Northern Ireland problem. <laughs> oh, great moment. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> tell us how you, how and when you decided you would try to get Richard Nixon to speak to you first, to be the first yes. person to talk to you, the first person he would talk to after his uh, exile began in San Clemente. Well, when I was um, in Australia, when, when on the day that the, um, that the actual resignation, and both in the same day because of the time difference, both his speech to the nation and his Eastrom speech the next morning were both in the same day in, in, in Australia. And I was just watching this and thinking, this man is the most fascinating, enigmatic, interesting. And to be able to speak to him first about, about the issues of guilt and innocence and all of those things, that, that is what I would most like to do to interview him of, 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 of anybody in the world. And when I talk to people about it en passant, they would all say, oh no, he'd never do that, he'd never do that. And I always quoted back to them David Schoenbrunn, you know, of uh, CBS News in England during the last war and saying, I'm going to try and get an interview with De Gaulle. And they all said, oh, damn, De Gaulle's ashamed to be here rather than in France. And, the last thing he's going to want to do is to give an interview, you know, and, and that's when Schoenberg said, let de Gaulle say no, you know, and that was absolutely basic to the pursuit of Richard Nixon. And it, took, it took about a year to reach the point where there was a real dialogue going on, and Clay Felker, the, uh, the editor-publisher and founder of New York magazine, called me from the Hamptons and said, I've got news for you. Swifty Lazar is coming into town this week, the legendary agent, and and apparently he's seeking a television memoir, something, a television outlet for President Nixon. And that was the green light, not the green light, but the opening that I was looking for. You had interviewed Nixon before, hadn't you? Yes, I had. I interviewed him in 1968. He'd just he just moved into his new offices in for the Nixon campaign for president in '68 um, in Park Avenue. Something about 380 seems to be familiar. But anyway, we got there before the furniture, and we, which was due the next day, and we were sitting on two miserable, miserably uncomfortable seats. But that didn't matter. <laughs> and uh, the and it was. It, I was asking all the candidates in that particular t time when I did all the candidates a lot of the same questions um, t to get the comparisons, deliberately to get the comparisons between them. And, uh, and Nixon was, 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 was very, very good in that situation. I mean, it, you know, he wasn't a ball of laughs or anything particularly, but he, he, he did it well and did it like a serious candidate, which he was, and uh, 
and that was the first time and that was actually the interview the interviews they were for 90 minutes special so that it was nine candidates I think it was of eight minutes each or eight candidates of nine minutes each one way around the and a fantastic all-star list because there was Robert Kennedy Hubert Humphrey oh. Ronald Reagan was running as long ago as as that Eugene McCarthy um, and then in addition to that Nelson Rockefeller uh, I mean it was just a remark and Richard Nixon uh, a remarkable list and Harold Stassen who had to have equal time in those days oh. with the others um, and uh, so it was a thrilling group of people to I always remember interviewing Eugene McCarthy in the Sheraton Wayfarer, in, as it then was, I don't know whether it still is, in Manchester, New Hampshire. And it was the week that George Romney, who had been figured as a major candidate for the Republicans, had come out with his statement that in his visit to Vietnam, he'd been brainwashed, if you remember, brainwashed. And people were, and one remark can kill you in America more than it can in Britain. And this remark did that for him. He was going to be a major candidate. And he said this one thing about being brainwashed. And everybody said, how dare he suggest that American generals would brainwash a candidate. And, uh, terrible. And within a week, he was a week or so, he was out of the race. And during that week, I was interviewing Eugene McCarthy in, in New Hampshire. And as we came out, there were three or four people wanting a soundbite. I don't think the word was invented then, but that's what it was. They wanted a soundbite. And one of them said, What do you think about George Romney being brainwashed? And McCarthy said, I would have thought a light rinse would have been sufficient. <laughs> Killer line. Killer line. Fantastic line, I thought. I mean, so gracious and decorous and yet such a, a zinger. How did Richard Nixon in 68 compare as, as an interview subject to the other seven or eight that you interviewed? You I think at that time he... He... Um, he compared very well with with most of them in, 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 in a similar way. They were answering some of the same questions. Um, I, think, I think Robert Kennedy was, at least for me, it was in a, a class of his own, really. I mean, I think he had such charisma. Maybe he'd mellowed from those people who thought he'd been ruthless or whatever and so on and so forth. But, but he, by that point, he had an incredible charisma and rereading his words they're they're very potent and you could see what a powerful candidate he would be or was he died within he was assassinated within four or five weeks and this was the last long interview he gave but he had one great quality and of course this is a quality that is really vital in american politics which is that self-deprecation quality of ducking compliments and being self-mocking and you know and at one point I said to him uh, a lot of people say that uh, that uh, the reason that you have a reputation with some people for being ruthless is that because the tough things you had to do uh, when you were campaign manager for your brother in 1960 and Kennedy smiled and said oh, no no that's, that's just my friends making excuses for me, you know, which is a very attractive, attractive quality. And the, uh, it reminds me actually also that in terms of Richard Nixon, that I don't know whether this story is apocryphal or, or real, but I was told by a couple of people, because people would come and after the impact of the interviews and, and tell me their stories about Richard Nixon. And lots of them were to do with small talk and the lack of small talk, but the, uh, but there was someone said that, that six months after Kennedy's inaugural, um, Vice President, as he once was, Nixon, met somewhere Ted Sorensen, Kennedy's speechwriter, and that uh, Nixon said to Ted Sorensen, oh, 
there were things in that speech that I would I, I would have loved to have said myself. So I said, oh, oh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vice President. You probably mean, ask not what you, your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Uh, and Nixon said, no, I was thinking more of, I hereby solemnly serve. <laughs> do you think that story is true? <laughs> it's a it's, great gag. It's a great gag. I'm not sure. It's not quite characteristic. We should ask Ted Sorensen. Ben? We should ask Ted Sorensen. Yeah. He's, he's alive and well. Um, uh, Sir David, let's fast forward. It's, it's now uh, seven, 1976. You're involved in this negotiation to land this huge interview. Tell us about some of the challenges that you faced. Well, the first simplistic challenge, I suppose, was, of course, the, uh, the, the small talk of Richard Nixon that everybody's had said and always said that Richard Nixon liked five minutes of small talk, of which he had none, before the meaning, meaningful part of the meeting took place. And it always surprised me that such a professional as Richard Nixon had not perfected, just as he perfected all these other political skills, had not perfected that, but, but everybody spoke of experiences with, with Nixon and and silences and, and and those things and going down there for the fi for the first contractual meeting but the final contractual meeting as well um, I knew that he insisted on or thought there should always be five minutes of small talk and so clutching at straws there was a thing in that day's Los Angeles Times about Brezhnev so I mentioned this and Nixon immediately said, oh, he said, I wouldn't want to be a Russian leader. They never know when they're being taped. <laughs> you know, which was such a wonderful dramatic irony, but he was not, not really aware of dramatic irony. So there was always through it all that when, when the time came for small talk, it was always a challenge. And people afterwards would, uh, would contact me and uh, there was a very... Someone contacted me that, that President Nixon, when he was president, had gone to a marine camp and the, the men and their wives and children had gathered to, to applaud the president and so on. And this particular guy was there with his daughter um, and, and not his wife who was working. And it just so happened that Richard Nixon uh, stopped in front of him and said to this guy, are you this little girl's mother? And what do you say? You're, you're talking to the President of the United States. You don't want to contradict the President of the United States, but you can't admit as a father to being a mother. I mean, so, you know, regardless of anything else. So he, he said, well, no, Mr. President, I, I am in fact her father. And Nixon said, of course you are, and slapped him around the face. And apparently the press corps spent half an hour, all of them, TV and radio and press, trying to work out why this had happened. And it took somebody half an hour, came up with a solution, that because Nixon was somewhat clumsy physically as well as verbally, that in fact, he realized he'd made a mistake and he was torn between going of course you are and going of course you are and he put the two together and belted him around the face but i mean it's a uh, those stories people were coming forward with, not as many physical stories as but that was one of the physical ones but the but anyway the 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 small talk and the lack of realization of the dramatic irony of uh, uh, was was always a factor but not not a major factor sir david we are uh, we are about to go to a break um, and when we come back we will talk about how facing this challenge you managed to craft historically important interviews thank you sir and we'll be back in a moment i'll be here <laughs> 
Afterwards and several other C-SPAN programs are available for download as podcasts. More with David Frost and Timothy Naftali in a moment. Next Sunday on Afterwards, in the ruins of Empire, historian Ronald Spector looks at the Pacific theater after World War II. He discusses the fight for independence that occurred in the two countries formerly occupied by the Japanese. He's interviewed by Stephen Clemens, director of the American Strategy Program at the New America Foundation and former director of the Japan Policy Research Institute. Afterwards, with Ronald Spector next Sunday at 6 p.m. and 9 p.m. and midnight Eastern. Afterwards, with David Frost and Timothy Naftali, continues. Welcome back. Uh, I'm Tim Naftali here with Sir David Frost on Afterwards. Um, we were just setting up the uh, historic Frost-Nixon interviews of 1977. Sir David, um, in your book, Frost-Nixon, you tell a remarkable story of a conversation you had with Jack Brennan. It's a conversation about arithmetic. Would you uh, tell us about that? It, it, it really gives a sense of the tension that existed between the Nixon camp and you. Well, yes, it was 60, 30, 10, wasn't it? Um, yes. That, that uh, Brennan was saying... Um, Jack Brennan was President Nixon's military aide, yeah, former yeah. President Nixon's military aide. That's time. right, and he became sort of chief of staff in this, in this period. And, and a good, a good chief of staff, I think. But he said on this particular occasion, 60% of the things that President Nixon did were, were good. 30% um, may not have been, but he didn't know it. Uh, and that left 10%, which were wrong, and he must have known about it because the percentage was left out. 30, 60, 30, 10. But then he threatened you. And he said, and he said at various times, he said yeah, that he would, if we, I was, uh, he was saying, if you s screw us on the, on the sixty percent or the ten percent, then then I will pursue you to your ruin, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I said, and if you stonewall us on Watergate and so on and so forth, I'll do the same and so on. So that in that moment, the two sides were getting ready, and at that time, uh, the. Later on, there was a pretty good relationship between the two sides. Well, there was a good relationship, and they were like two young lawyers' teams, as it were, meeting at the end of the day to discuss how their relative bosses had done, and so on and so forth. And it was a sort of quite collegial at that level, because Nixon had really in the team he had there of, uh, with Jack Brennan, Ken Kasiga, but then uh, Diane Sawyer and Frank Gannon and and uh, Ray Price and so on was a was an all-star team intellectually and indeed if he'd been had them running the White House he might not have gone into quite as much trouble because because they were an impressive team but anyway during the period when we were fencing for position and I was desperate for the uh, a good example of Nixon's sense of humor here because um, I was saying we've got to get to Watergate by I don't care what the problems are by March, because then it'll be on the air by May, whereas otherwise it won't get on the air until August. And, uh, and you know, and advertisers know you don't get much of an audience in, in August. And Nixon said, we got a hell of an audience on August the 9th, 1974. Anyway, brilliant line about the f fact of the day that he resigned, you know, and was, that was an example of the fact that, uh, Nixon, you know, did have a sense of humor. Not quite, the, not necessarily the, 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 the marvelous sort of one-liners that uh, Peter Morgan has added to him in, in the play, Frost Nixon, but, but, but he did have a sense of humor, not, not exactly a free-flowing sense of humor, not, not a wildly ad-libbing sense of humor, but he, but he, could, he could make remarks, make jokes. Huh? Um, tell, me, tell us about your team. We well, had a team. Well, there was a, they, John Burt, uh, who was uh, later to be director general of the BBC and so on and so forth, and was the best current affairs producer I'd ever worked with. Uh, I managed to persuade him he was by then 
um, in charge of current affairs at London Weekend Television, but, I, but he got a sabbatical for, for, for three months to come and work on it, and he was crucial. Bob Zelnick, who had been with National Public Radio and after these interviews went to ABC News as defense correspondent, and he, and he was sort of in charge of the material, really, and pulling it together, as he himself described it as that he was the bureau chief of the smallest bureau in Washington, you know, because there were really four of them. Phil Stanford, who couldn't come to the final interviews uh, because of other, other commitments, and James Reston, who, who was very interested in the psychological parts of the thing, but also found some famous tapes that, that were not famous then, because no one knew about them, but, but they were very helpful. We, we got them, in fact, eight months before, before the interviews, not as in the play immediately before, but, the, uh, but James Reston was very valuable in that way, and, uh, and, and they, they had their disagreements, but they basically worked together really well as a team. Did you have to prepare for this differently, from the, in a different way from you, the way you prepared for other big interviews? Yes, I think, I think particularly in, in terms of time, uh, you know, that really one was working on this pretty solidly for a year to know the tapes well enough and all of that stuff and, and producing documents and papers and so on because as you all know one of the things about Nixon for instance was that it was, he, was not a, he was not a cooperative witness he was, the, the amazing admissions that he eventually made were made on the defensive because he didn't really have any other option anywhere else to go and, and so that it was no point asking him about anything that you didn't have proof of because he would never volunteer, I must admit, something or other when, if nobody knew it, you know, so that, for instance, there was no evidence uh, at that time of, I don't think there is now, that, that Nixon knew about the Watergate break-in in advance. So, it was pointless asking about it because he would just deny it and so on. It was only worth asking about things where you had good evidence that the thing had taken place and then he was more on the defensive and so on. But, but no point, it, excluding the subjects that there were no point in raising was very important and the classic one was that, the, the Watergate break-in. Hmm. Um, you did some interviews uh, before you met with him, you talked to, uh, at least the book says you talked to John Dean, you talked to uh, um, uh, Nixon's uh, former lawyer. You t what were they telling you about how to ask questions of the president? Well, w we, did, we did talk to a lot of those people. I didn't personally talk, meet, uh, meet John Dean. Um, it's interesting what people do say to you in... Uh, I mean, before I first interviewed Margaret Thatcher, I asked one of, one of her senior cabinet ministers uh, about asking Margaret Thatcher questions, and, and he said, well, it doesn't matter, you won't get a word in edgeways, <laughs> you know, but, but it, wasn't, it turned out not to be altogether true, and certainly it wasn't true of, of, of Nixon. Um, but the, uh, I'm just trying to think of the... Uh, the people I did speak to personally, I mean, I spoke to Holderman uh, personally, and uh, it's quite funny because he, we agreed in order to maintain the secrecy of the thing that, that when he called back, he would use his wife's, name as, as a code and say it was Mr. Sansa. Uh, so the switchboard wouldn't know. And, uh, and then the, the Beverly Hilton f phone rang and they said, it's a Mr. Holderman on the phone for you. And, I, and he came on, he said, I'm terribly sorry, but I've forgotten my code word. <laughs> 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 Which was sweet, really. But, but the... Um, but so I, I, I talked to him, I talked to Anthony Ulasowicz, who was a major, um, I talked to Spiro Agnew too. Um, Sp Spiro Agnew, actually the session with Spiro Agnew was the most bewildering, really, almost, with 
Richard Nixon because Nixon was not as furious with him as one would have expected him to be. And in fact, he was almost positively exculpatory in terms of, and I don't know why, because there was Agnew had basically broken the law with, and, and, uh, with bribes and so on and so forth. And, and, uh, and, the, uh, and, he, and he was saying things like that, you know, that I think that I don't think that uh, Vice President Agnew um, ever took a bribe from anyone who he didn't think was the best man for the job. <laughs> <laughs> this idea of people being, giving out bribes when they were going to get the job anyway, I mean, was, was, was bizarre, but, he, but I don't know quite why. And afterwards I did say to him why were you so generous in a way, and he said, well, I didn't want to kick a man when he's down. Was what he said. But it was, it was a surprise. I mean, you, there's, there was an example of something that none of us would have choreographed this generous performance over over Agni. How did you choose the topics of your of the programs? We, they, they sort of chose themselves to a certain extent. There was there, there was one uh, obviously going to be one on Watergate, one on foreign policy, one on abuse of power, and one that variously got named Nixon the man or whatever and there's a very there's a good joke of Peter Morgan's in in the play where Nixon is asking Jack Brennan what what are the other subjects well foreign policy and, and so on and so forth and uh, oh and Nixon the man and Nixon replies as opposed to what Nixon the horse you know, which, which is a very good line, gets a big laugh from the audience. But that's the sort of one-liner that I couldn't imagine Nixon coming up with a fast one-liner. He, he would come out with a, if he was going to be humorous, uh, he, he would come out with a slower anecdote, wouldn't he, he? But there is a part of the play which sounds completely made up, but in fact it happened in the play and in the book. Well, why don't you tell us? Did Nixon ask you whether you had engaged in fornicating? Yes, and it's, and it was a stunning moment. We we made up in two sep, uh, we were made up, I suppose, in two separate bedrooms in this house, and then we walked through the. This is in Monarch Bay, right? Monarch Bay, right. just down the road from San Clemente, and we went, and then we'd walk through the kitchen where the, the aides the six or eight aides would be having a coffee before going to their separate uh, viewing rooms in other bedrooms. And as we went through, he tried to be one of the boys with, with the cameraman, for instance, and saying, come on, we're, we're all hard hats together, these flaky journalists and all that stuff. So, and this morning he decided to be one of the boys with me, and he, as we were walking through the kitchen, he suddenly said, did you do any fornicating this weekend? Well, if I hadn't got eight stunned faces in front of me, you know, I would have thought I'd gone bonkers and imagined the whole thing, you know, I mean, and he, he, and he got, he tried to be one of the boys and got the word wrong, you know, because you know, lovers don't call themselves fornicators any, any more than freedom fighters call themselves terrorists or something like that. I mean, it's just not something you say about yourself, is it? And, uh, and I knew he didn't really want to know the answer to it, so I said, well, I never, never discussed my private life, and oh, here we are, and we were in the main, in the main room, but it was absolutely... Strong. Now, there is a... I mentioned that James Reston... Uh, very was very interested not just in this but 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 the psych psychology and he thinks that I got the day wrong in saying when this happened and he thinks that that the I mean he agrees with absolutely the text of this the fornication discussion but he thinks it was the the day after the, or the two days after the 
the session on Watergate where Nixon had done his mea culpa and, and we'd reached that amazing climax and that Nick, mentally what Nixon had been thinking was that David or Mr. Frost, um, had, he'd had a triumph on Friday and how would he have celebrated? Uh, this is how he would have celebrated. And so that's why he raised, raised the subject on the Monday. But I'm not sure, my diary doesn't tell me which, which of the two Mondays it was. It was a Monday, but, uh, uh, but, but I mean, it's, pos it's possible that he would have thought that way. Is this the, also the time when, when uh, President Nixon talked to your lady friend about Leonard Brezhnev? Oh yes, that was, that was adorable. That was, that was the magic, that was as, as magic a moment as one could wish for with Richard Nixon. It was 20 minutes when one could only describe him as being carefree. And I think that, I've never re read anyway anyone calling Nixon carefree, but for that 20 minutes that uh, I went down with my girlfriend Caroline to take my leave of Nixon, we'd edited all four programs, two had gone out and so on. And, and just for 20 magic minutes, the, the, the shield that he, you felt him, him putting up between himself and the rest of the world disappeared. And he was genuinely carefree. And he took Caroline on a trip and he said, that's, that's the room where Brezhnev used to sleep. He was a great swordsman, you know. The Russians are, you know. And, and then he said, said to Manolo, Manolo, get out the, the caviar that the Shah sent us for Christmas. And, uh, oh, well, come in and, and, come in and do for them the, uh, your impression of Henry, Henry Kissinger. And, and all of those things. And it had started, incidentally, by, the, by him saying, hello, David, you know, the, which, which was the first and only time he'd ever said that and, 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 and that was a carefree 20 minutes and then by the time just before we were leaving the, 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 the screens were coming down again not I mean transparent screens but uh, uh, and not in any sense it wasn't that he was rude or wasn't affable he was affable often do you know what I mean but 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 you always felt there was a real reserve there and this was the only 20 minutes when I could say that well, there was no reserve there. And that was a very, very uh, special experience. You mentioned Henry Kissinger. And uh, before we go on to talk about the famous Watergate uh, interviews, uh, you actually talked to Henry Kissinger after the foreign, one of the foreign policy interviews. Yes. Would you tell, that story is in the book and it's remarkable. What happened? Well, what happened was that the... the Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon had this problem that they both wanted the credit for the good things that had happened in foreign policy and they didn't want the, they wanted the other one to have the blame for the things that hadn't gone so well uh, and but most of all they they were they were bidding for the credit but they couldn't they couldn't do it by being hostile to the other one because they were joined at the waist as it were umbilically anyway uh, and so they had to do it decorously because they because you know the verdict on them at the end of the day will probably be a joint verdict or whatever so what happened was that in these interviews Richard Nixon would say so he got to sound positive about Henry but he wanted to get in his his little zinger as it were so he would say he'd say things like well, of course, you know, Henry Kissinger was a uh, very brilliant man, a brilliant uh, intellectual, a real intellectual, you know. Uh, you know, all intellectuals, of course, are somewhat unstable, but, um, you know, as long as there was someone there to keep him on the straight and narrow, then, uh, you know, then he, he, he was a brilliant intellectual, you know, so, so. so this was, you know, that Henry could not have done anything he did without the strong fatherly arm of Richard Nixon around him, you know, and I was, I was uh, talking to uh, 
Henry Kissinger on the phone after we taped this session, and he said, oh, well, you'll be getting on to me about now. He said, I suppose Nixon disguised me as an unreliable intellectual who doesn't stick to his point of view and wants to change his views at the last minute and so on. And I said, Henry, have you been bugging these sessions? And he said, no, David, I just know my boy. He said, I just know my boy. And, uh, and the postscript to that was that, that, uh, that Henry's line was um, always more, he would take the line of saying, President Nixon was a great president. And perhaps his greatest quality was his ability to delegate. And all the really important things he delegated to me. You know, that, that, that sort of, the, not quite as blatant as that, but you know, but that's, that sort of, uh, that was his way of get, getting getting his the point. credit. In the, in the play, and soon to be the movie, there is a dramatic tension. Uh, one gets the sense that, that your team primarily, but to some extent you, are a little disappointed after the first few interviews. And in fact, there is a question of whether this whole thing will be a failure or success until the Watergate interview. To what extent is that true? Well, it's exaggerated. Um, the, the, the thing is that I agreed with their suggestion that uh, Peter and uh, Matthew, I'm sure, that it would be better if I didn't have editorial control of this because it, it, then it wouldn't look like a Frost promoting himself or, you know, or, or, or self-serving or whatever. So that means that obviously there are things in it that I ne wouldn't necessarily have put in. And there's 15% of it, I suppose, is fictional, including one brilliant bit of fiction, Nixon's phone call to me on the eve of Watergate, you know, which never happened. But, but I mean, that, that's a brilliant bit of writing. I mean, serious bit of writing. But one of the things that uh, uh, Peter did was he, in order to build up to the climax, first of all, he moved the Watergate session, session instead of two sessions to one at the end to build up there. And he, he, he built up com completely the idea of how disastrous the first two or three sessions were. They weren't that bad at all. Um, the, so there was, there was and, and even in the, um, and in the play that, that you know, that I, I challenged them at one point to the fact that if they, if they really think we're confronting failure, they should leave now to the team and, and none of them do um, but so that, that, that there was concern there was in all of us in the sense that Richard Nixon was taking more time to say things not that he was filibustering in a destructive way but he was just taking more time and we would need more time and uh, and 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 in fact I mean that, that uh, a lot of them have, have reread stuff recently and, and I mean the Vietnam material is much stronger than people realized at the time, in fact, in terms of uh, Nixon, Nixon's approach on Vietnam. So, so the, the answer is that I never, I don't know that they did either. I certainly never contemplated the likelihood of failure. Did I contemplate the possibility of failure is the question. And I don't know the answer to that. But. The day you arrived for the first Watergate interview, you describe yourself as euphoric. Why? Uh, at the beginning, did I say that at the yeah. beginning? Well, the, the fact that it was really happening, that would have been, yes, because was, I was euphoric at the end of the second day, obviously. No doubt. But, but, the, but, 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 but the, the, this moment had actually come to pass that one had been working towards for, by this time, by two and a half years, because there was, there was a, a year of preparing f to get the, get the scoop, and there was the period from when we got the scoop in August, uh, 75 till till March 77 when we did it. So the fact that these these three years of effort had come together. Um, tell us about this moment when there's a break in that first m interview. It's a very dramatic yeah. moment. It's both in the play and you describe it in the book. Yeah. How does it happen? What happened? Well, what happened is very interesting. That because. It, it's an imp it was an important event in the in reality, and it was an important event in the play, and and it's and it's quite different in the in the two versions. 
um, there is a pause in each and and in the in the play Peter has it that in fact Jack Brennan came out as chief of staff to Nixon to stop the taping in order to say to Richard Nixon I think you're on the verge of going further than you ever meant to go and I think you should think twice about it before you go that far and all my team are absolutely furious and, and so on about it. So that was, that was Jack Brennan wanting to slow down the process, maybe stop it or maybe not stop it, but slow down the process of, of his, his gro growing towards his mea culpa. Now what actually happened was that, that there was Suddenly, Jack Brennan, who'd never been into the main room where we had the three, you know, I suppose the room was a bit bigger than this room and, and it just had three cameras in it and, and a floor manager and, and the cameraman. And he'd never been in. And he came in with a, a sign that I thought said, let us talk. And it was a dramatic moment. Nixon had started talking about mistakes, he was going on from mistakes. It was a dramatic moment and I was fascinated. Why was Brennan saying, let us talk? And so I thought, well, we could take a brief tape break and find out. And so I said, all right, we've just got to change tapes or whatever. And it turned out that in fact, Jack Brennan was carrying a card which, when he came closer, uh, in fact said, let him talk. So far from wanting to suppress Nixon's frankness, he was encouraging me to let it roll because he thought that Nixon really wanted to say something. He'd reached this point in this confrontation. We were, I suppose, two hours into this second of the two two-hour sessions. And, and so far, so actually it doesn't really do him justice, the, the, uh, the play. I mean, it's, it's as, as Peter uh, Morgan sweetly said whenever I said, but so-and-so about something that didn't happen, he, he, he'd sort of sigh in a sort of patient way as if he was talking to a child and, and say, David, this is not a documentary, it's a play you know, he'd say. And, uh, but in that particular case, so there was a completely different construction in the two. There was the pause, but in fact, in real life, he was actually encouraging me not to interrogate too much, but to give him a chance to, um, to say more, which I was actually already doing, in fact, by that stage. And, and of course, it linked in with the moment when I was saying, can't you go further than the mistakes, the word that seems not enough for people to understand. And, and him, the heart stopping moment when he said, well, what word would you express? You know, and I knew, I knew at that moment he was more vulnerable than he'd ever been in his life again and, and that I had to get it right. And so I, uh, I threw, I mustn't throw my own book on the floor, but anyway, I, 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 <laughs> I threw a clipboard onto the floor, the famous clipboard, because I wanted him to know this was not a prepared shtick. This was something that neither of us anticipated. And then I said, well, I think there are three things that the American people want to hear you say. And the first is that there was wrongdoing, you know, maybe criminality as well, although I knew it was difficult for him legally to admit to a mm. crime. Uh, so that's why I, I used the word wrongdoing. Uh, secondly, that uh, you let down your entire oath of office and so on as president. Thirdly, you put the American people through t two years of needless pain and you apologize for that. And that, I know that's difficult for anybody but particularly difficult for you. But if you don't do it, I think you'll be haunted for the rest of your life. And in the remaining 20 minutes of the interview, 15 minutes of it on the air or whatever, 
he did address all of those three points and finally came to the American people. Now what do I think about the American people? I mean, he, he retained, which oddly enough in television terms, of course you were talking about the most dramatic things in his life, but nevertheless, you know, you can put three points to someone who after 15 minutes will say, and what was the third one again? You know, quite reasonably, you know, because mm -hmm. you're on television, mm -hmm. you forget. But he didn't forget at all. He, he, he dealt with each of them in turn and came to that uh, nail-biting climax at the end. But that was the, that was the moment when it intensified. Sir David, your book tells the story. The play in the future film will tell a version of the story. And we are fortunate to have had you in the studio today to tell us what you recall. Thank you very much.